All right, next bullet point. Um, Neo-grammarians described language as, quote, and this is a quote also from uh, Saussure, quote, language as a collective mind of a linguistic community. And this, this is what really, really strikes a chord with Saussure. The way that I, I sort of think of Saussure whenever I, you know, whenever I read him or now that I'm lecturing on him, I think of Saussure's, Saussure's relationship with the Neo-Grammarians as similar to Kant's relationship with Hobbes. Um, Kant reads Hobbes, and it was after reading, not Hobbes, uh, Hume, sorry, Kant's, Kant's relationship with Hume. It was after Kant read Hume that he, quote-unquote, was, um, he was, uh, he was woken from his dogmatic slumber. Right? He recognized in Hume something that he never recognized before. And it was because of Hume's account that Kant was able to uh, eventually articulate um, his categorical imperatives, the synthetic a priori, and blah, blah, blah. Um, Hume played a huge factor in that. Similarly, for at least my account of Saussure, is that it, it's in recognizing, and I'm going to read the sentence again, it's recognizing the role of the linguistic community that the neo-grammarians emphasized that really struck a chord with Saussure. Saussure, and again, remember, Saussure didn't write the text, his students wrote the text, but I would imagine, though they don't say it in the book, that in a lecture he must have been going on and on and on and on about the neo-grammarians, right? Um, it's a recognition that when we're talking about, and if we're attempting to talk about the conditions for the possibility of language, then it must be the case that we recognize that you cannot do this analysis um, strictly with the individual. Why? Because we're social beings, and insofar as we're social beings, quote, um, we must account for, quote, a collective mind of the linguistic community. And I give a very simple um, diagram, right? The linguistic community is a condition for the possibility of, of language itself, right? The linguistic community serves um, to, to sort of posit the structure of language. This is a very, very simple account. It gets complicated later. Why? The idea to think, sort of, if you think historically now, right? Um, and there might be some debate. It would be interesting, uh, now that I think about it, it would be interesting and I don't want to go too far off on a tangent, but it just jumped in my head. It would be interesting to see what a semiological account of the origins of language would be for a creationist, right? A creationist believes that, in a non-evolutionary sense, it, obviously in evolutionary terms we can sort of make an account of this, right? It is a, a function of our adaptation. It is selected as, um, uh, as, as a characteristic that we have which will improve our um, evolutionary adaptability. In a creationist mode, though, the, the language from the very beginning, right, must have been given, right? There must have been, that is very, I don't know that anybody's written that. But anyway, yeah, it, I would be, quick side, if you're still watching the video after <laughs> all this time, um, if you know of a creationist account of semiology, I would, of a book, I would like to read it. Um, I don't know of anybody who's given a creationist account of semiotics. Um, all of this semiotics presupposes, I guess in a sense, not directly, some evolutionary account, right? There had to be a beginning in which we formulated this process. Um, but what is the account of this process if we start with Adam and Eve, right? They're talking from the beginning. So where you know the question is where did they where did they get that ability to talk, right? If God gave it to them, then there must have been wow that's fascinating. Anyway, so yeah, um, anybody knows the creationist account of semiotics? I'm sure someone's written a book on it. Uh, please comment in the in the in the thing below. Send me an email. Send me. But I, I definitely want to know how that is because I wouldn't even know how to begin that analysis. It'd be interesting to see what a, um, a creationist account of uh, semiotics would be. Tangent. Anyway. Back on track. Uh, next point, neo-grammarians still. Um, a linguistic community is an antecedent condition, as we said, both necessary and uh, sufficient for language. You cannot have, as I gave in the, uh, the timeline, right? If this is an indication of my birth, that's an indication of death, birth, death. Um, there was a time prior, language existed. There'll be a time after, language exists. I am born into this structure. I'm born into the structure of 
language so that the linguistic community um, serves as the condition for the possibility of uh, my parole, like pro, I can never say that right, my parole, 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 um, right, my, my speech act. Um, it's important to recognize, however, uh, and another, and I'm not going to get into Wittgensteinian sort of, he doesn't do a semiotics, but he does talk about language. Um, I'm going to give you the, the, the two-second version of Wittgenstein's critique of private language. So, and this, the, the reason why it's important to understand Wittgenstein at this point is because he sort of reinforces, uh, his claim reinforces this neo-grammarian point, right? What Wittgenstein says is that it's impossible for you to have a private language. I remember I was a young boy, and my brother and I wanted to create, like, a private language so we can talk, and, you know, outside of uh, other siblings and, and uh, um, peering adult eyes. But we failed because... <laughs> Because we weren't semiologists, right? We didn't. There was no relationship between the words that we were saying and the stuff in the world. So we were just talking foolishness, right? And we actually had a name for it. We called it ground talk, and this is true. Um, so we would be talking this foolishness, and we'd be laughing, but there was nothing that was really communicated, right? What Wittgenstein is saying um, is think of the 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 scenario of Robinson Crusoe. So Robinson Crusoe is stranded on the island with Man Friday. Man Friday is a mute, can't talk. Um, you don't want to be stranded on the island with a mute, right? Because if the boat, if the boat is coming and you want to be rescued, how the hell is Man Friday going to help you? He, he can't really help you. But the point is, but he can, right? He might not be able to say boat because he can't articulate it, but he can draw a picture of a boat. And insofar as he's drawn a picture of the boat, that picture points to the actual thing in the world, right? So that there's some account in which he's attempting to externalize, despite the fact that he can't speak, some representation of the thing, the boat, in the sand. Let's say he takes up a piece of stick and he draws it, and then they're rescued. There is no sense in which I create a uniquely private language um, and I can make sense of the world, because it, it, it's impossible, right? So what neo-grammarians recognize and what they emphasize, and this is really what fuels Saussure's account in um, his course, his, his discussion in the course in uh, general linguistics, is that the linguistic community is essential to an understanding of semiotics. You cannot talk about semiotics, you cannot talk about semiology in any sense unless you recognize and acknowledge the role of the linguistic community. They're inextricably bound. Um, what we'll do later is via Lacan, Lacan says, well, yes, but, um, and we'll see what that but is. Um, it's not that Lacan is denying, um, and the stuff that I saw in Lacan um, with respect to this wasn't, uh, wasn't, it didn't really make too much sense, and as you guys know, I'm a bit of a Zizek groupie. I haven't really seen Zizek do, uh, I don't know if Zizek did a lecture on this. If he did, then listen to what Zizek says. Don't listen to me, because he knows more than I know with respect to Lacan. Um, so I'll talk about the but, right? It's not that um, uh, Lacan via Freud is denying the role of the linguistic community in the, the relationship between the picture of the boat and the boat it's that Lacan says there's a huge but, let's not forget the role of the individual. And I, you know, his, his text is very, very sort of muddled in, in technicalities, but that's essentially what he's attempting to do. He's giving us a big but. It's not just the, at least my interpretation of Lacan is that he's saying but. Okay. Um, 